Okay. So, what is a complex? Complexes are fundamental structures of the human psyche. They can be thought of as discrete centers of energy within the psyche. They're often organized around a specific theme, relationship, or situation. These complexes are often depicted in dreams as figures, what Jung terms personifications. And personification simply means a recurrent psychological process which becomes depicted in dreams as a figure or a series of similar figures. But a complex can also be depicted by the context of a dream, the actions in a dream, objects in a dream, or situations portrayed in the dream. They're naturally occurring psychological phenomenon, which typically develop along positive or negative lines. In therapy, we usually encounter the negative aspects of a complex. However, a positive mother complex can be just as life-sustaining as a negative mother complex can be destructive to life. And yet, even a positively constellated mother complex taken to an extreme can be limiting or destructive. The theory of complexes is so central to Jung's model that at one point he considered labeling his theoretical system complex psychology rather than analytical psychology. The idea of complex is a robust concept for the practicing therapist and as a means of orienting with one, within one's individual path towards wholeness that Jung refers to as individuation. having to juggle a little bit to let new participants join while we're doing the presentation. Some common complexes are mother, father, inferiority complex, authority complex, victim, hero, child, savior, and money, to name just a few. A simple complex is defined as having a personalistic overlay and an archetypal core, meaning a central core at the, cent the core of the, arc of the complex. So you might wonder, well, what's in this personalistic overlay? Well, within this personalistic shell around the archetypal core, there are specific memories, images, feelings, behavioral patterns, defenses, cognitive patterns, specific values or attitudes, physiological states, and pa patterns of object relatedness, which is just means that the patterns that we tend to fall into when we move into relationship with others. And so each complex, while there may be some degree of overlap in functioning between them, each one is going to have a unique constellation of these nine characteristics. So if we think of the ego complex, Jung is not using the term ego as it is popularly used to refer to self-esteem. I have a good ego, for example. He says the ego is a complex, that peculiar complex whose inner cohesion amounts to consciousness. He goes on to say that by ego, I understand a complex of ideas which constitutes the center of my field of consciousness and appears to possess a high degree of continuity and identity. He often associated the mythological motif of the hero's journey with the developmental arc of the ego. In this motif, the hero must leave his established community, that is to differentiate, do battle with the king of the land moving into, engage and defeat the father complex, and slay the dragon, defeat the mother complex, to be transformed, solidified by these experiences. And Jung proposes that the archetypal center of the ego complex is the self. Now to put this in a bit larger context, 
Jung offers this model of the psyche where we have the tip of the iceberg or the tip of the pyramid is our ego consciousness. It's actually, we think of it, we often prefer to think of it as the master of the house and it's actually not. It's a small bit of our psyche that rests on a layer of personal complexes that Jung refers to as the personal unconscious and an even deeper, broader layer of the collective unconscious, the universal aspects of human experience to which we're all connected. He called these characteristics of the collective unconscious, the archetypes. More recently, a term has been introduced to the cultural complex by two analysts, Thomas Singer and Samuel Kimballs. And they say, not only is there an archetypal layer and a personal layer, there's a cultural layer that is in between the archetypal and the personal. And that cultures themselves, not just individuals, but groups that form a culture can have complexes in it. This is a relatively new conceptualization of a level of experience and influence. While they're akin to personal complexes, when activated, they take hold of the collective psyche of the group, functioning autonomously within the culture, the organized group life, and facilitate functioning of the individual within the group and give rise to a sense of belonging. Alternatively, they may function as part of a traumatic group defense. Naturally, we've seen numerous examples of active cultural complexes playing out across the world during the last five years in particular. So one way of visualizing this is to think of three different layers of experience, personal, cultural, and archetypal, and that the complex bridges across all three layers moving from something that's more available to consciousness to something that's almost completely unconscious and can only be seen indirectly through images. In other words, Jung says we never see the archetype itself. We only see the archetype as it becomes portrayed in culture or in our dreams. So this is a little bit of conceptual history of complexes, not so much that I think you need to know all of the developmental history of the, com the concept, but some of the language Jung use is helpful to develop a more differentiated sense of the idea. So beginning in 1904, when he was doing his experiments with the association test, he referred to it as a sum of ideas referring to a particular feeling tone event. He actually began first talking about this in his doctoral dissertation in 1902. While he doesn't use the term complex, he's using ideas that would become complex theory. He also describes them as dissociated personalities miniature self-contained psyches, focal and nodal points of psychic life, fragmentary personalities, splinter psyches, and the architect of the unconscious fantasy system manifested as dreams and symptoms. And we'll return to this last one in, in, in a little more depth later in the program. Jung also referred to chronic complexes, those that have a continuously active feeling tone, sometimes over a number of years. And he also uses the term complex sensitiveness to describe a condition similar to post-traumatic stress disorder in which the original stimulus continues to evoke a similar response even after the more overt aspects of a complex have diminished. So we have some general ideas about the theory. And here are some characteristics that Jung identifies. The concept of the complex links both personal and archetypal and cultural components of individual experience. It bridges the intrapsychic, meaning what's happening in us, 
and the interpersonal, meaning what's happening in our outer relationships, what Jung referred to as the subjective level and the objective level in an intertwined manner. Complexes are formed partially through interactions with others, the culture they grow up in and the various experiences in life. As these complexes become part of the individual's internal structure, they begin to influence the individual's perceptions of and interactions with the outer world, as well as their inner world. Complexes are independent or autonomously functioning. Now what Jung means by that is that they're autonomous from the ego, autonomous from our consciousness. They're aspects of the unconscious personality which are often at odds with the conscious ego attitude. Complexes have the capacity to temporarily push the ego complex out of the central role it plays in consciousness. Complexes impact us both intrapsychically and interpersonally via projection and introjection. Now, just a bit about Freud and Jung. Freud in 1910 adopted the term complex from Jung, specifically in reference to the Oedipal complex. Of course, this was when Jung and Freud were still collaborating. Their break was in 1912 and 1913 when Jung published Symbols of Transformation, which was his first book length manuscript, which had some material that was at odds with some of Freud's primary ideas. Jung's interest was always on the complex. According to Jung, the complex, not the dream, is the via regia, the road to, the royal road to the unconscious. The via regia to the unconscious, however, is not the dream as he, Freud thought, but the complex, which is the architect of dreams and of symptoms. He differentiates himself further from Freud by saying Freud is seeking the complexes. I am not. I am looking for what the unconscious is doing with the complexes. Now, reading between the lines, what he's saying is what the unconscious is doing with the complexes is the idea of this is not an intellectual process. It's an experience. It's an engagement with living things, not ideas. So what is an, the experience of a complex? A complex often feels like it comes on us suddenly, shifting how we feel, how we interact, how we think, how we behave, or even altering our perceptions of different situations. People in the midst of complex often say, I don't feel like myself. It is often first encountered in projected form as a strong reaction, positive or negative, to a characteristic seen in someone else. The task is to begin to withdraw the projection by recognizing it as something actually operating within our own psyche. Depending on how one is organized in your personality, that can be a very difficult task to even recognize the need to do this. Complexes are readily encountered as personified figures within our dreams and fantasies. Often it is necessary to interact with or confront the complex through inner dialogue, which Jung termed active imagination, or through dream work. So let me give you an example of a complex in one of my patients, which I'll refer to as Maggie. And this is a negative mother complex. So the memories, which is really the personal origins of the complex. Maggie's mother was reportedly unpredictably angry and violent. At times she would beat Maggie with the handle of a broom, sometimes breaking the handle over her back. Her mother appears to have favored her sons over her daughters. When Maggie told her mother of sexual abuse by her brothers, her mother accused Maggie of having done something to provoke it and punished Maggie by roughly scrubbing her vaginal area with a soapy dish brush. Self-experience, when the negative mother complex is activated. Maggie views herself as worthless, unlovable, and worthy of punishment and has an with an inability to develop feelings of caring towards herself. 
The feelings and affects are fear, anxiety, depression, feelings of worthlessness and helplessness. Her behavioral patterns. Maggie often withdraws interpersonally and frequently relies on self-mutilation, such as burning, cutting, ingestion of high quantities of over-the-counter analgesics, which exacerbate intense pain from ulcers. So she attacks both the outside and the inside of her body. She also feels that she needs to barricade herself into her house every night to protect herself from unknown intruders. Defenses include dissociation, repression, and psychic numbing as primary defenses. Object relationships. She experiences any relationship as quite fragile and always on the verge of abandoning her. Physiological states. She has intense psychomotor agitation, meaning getting really worked up physiologically, alternating with psychomotor retardation, meaning that she feels very lethargic and slowed down. The archetypal core I refer to as the witch mother. For years, she has had the belief associated with intense, intense fear that her mother could see or hear our conversations and would punish her for talking about her mother. Now that her mother has passed, she experiences tremendous loss, abandonment, and a feeling of aloneness in the world. Transference, meaning Maggie's feelings towards me in the context of our therapy work. Maggie can easily shift to seeing me as being angry with her and works hard to avoid making me angry and becoming apologetic for doing things that I refer to as imaginary crimes. So to break that piece of it out, I've thought through so the, the cycle said from an internal uh, first person perspective that constitutes Maggie's affective behavioral pattern when she's in the child complex in relationship to the negative mother. I feel angry. I expect others will hurt me or reject me. So these are two independent clauses. The third clause that ties the first two together, other people will hurt me or reject me if I'm angry. The behavioral conclusion in this cycle is I should hurt myself instead, instead of expressing my anger. Complexes and healing. For Jung, his concept of complexes is central to his understanding of symptoms and psychopathology. However, he also saw the complexes pointing the way towards the cure. Becoming conscious of, interactive with, and understanding, that is reflection upon, the complex sets the stage for progressive depotentiation of the complex, meaning taking the power out of it. Ideally, with an accompanying assimilation of some of the complex contents into the overall structure of the self. Jung says, a neurosis is a dissociation of personality due to the existence of complexes. Neurosis was just a broad term of the time to refer to particular types of diagnoses, usually focused primarily around anxiety and depression. He goes on to say that the outbreak of a neurosis is actually an attempt at self-cure. It is an attempt of the self-regulating psychic system to restore balance in no way different from the function of dreams. In other words, a primary perspective for Jung was that the psyche was always trying to seek balance and that our conscious attitude can often become unbalanced. For example, overworking and that the, the psyche is going to try to call our attention to the problematic behavior while at the same time in calling our attention to it is trying to restore an appropriate balance between conscious and unconscious activity. 
Now, while Jung was the originator of this idea, there's many other psychoanalytic models that have picked up this idea, not, not necessarily even knowing about Jung's idea of complexes, but developing along similar lines. The followers of Melanie Klein and object re relations theorists call them internal object relations. Self-psychology calls them affect-laden thematic organizations. In infant research, they call them repetitions of interactions generalized or rigs. In attachment theory, they call them internal working models. In control mastery theory, they call them pathogenic adaptations. More broadly, in narrative therapy, they call them narrative scripts. And in personal construct theory, these are referred to as constructs. But they're all playing around with the same idea that we have these models inside of us that we work out of in terms of living our life and understanding ourselves. Now, Jung proposed that there were four functional complexes and that everyone has these four complexes as well as a variety of more idiosyncratic complexes that have a more idiosyncratic function within the individual psyche. But he felt these four complexes, ego, shadow, and persona, and anima animus, all formed a similar, performed a similar function within everyone's psyche. As previously mentioned, the ego is the center of consciousness and the sense of identity. The shadow is the repository of all things rejected by the ego and undeveloped in the psyche. The persona is the mediator between the ego and the outer world, and often the outer the outward manifestation of the ego ideal. In other words, we have our sense of who we think we are, and then the ego ideal is who we think we should be. And often we craft the persona around our ego ideal, which is how we want others to perceive us. And then anima animus, sometimes simply referred to as the soul figure, is the mediator between the ego and the unconscious sometimes referred to as the personification of the unconscious or the soul. So we can look at this visually also, and to think the conscious outer world in the upper right-hand corner, this is we meet with the, our persona. We know that our persona is based on the ego ideal, the way we want the world to see us, even if we don't necessarily believe everything we project out into the world as being us. The shadow stands in relationship to the ego. It's all of the things we would prefer not to be and that we certainly don't want to know about it ourselves. And even more so, we don't want the world to know about it. So it's rejected or disowned parts of ourselves as well as parts of ourselves that have never had an opportunity to develop. So the example I give of that, we often think about the shadow as kind of dark elements of ourselves that we feel guilt or shame about. But it can also be, for example, an artistic child born into a family of well-intentioned parents of whom both are engineers. And while they may do everything in their power to be good parents, they still may not quite get the, the, the child's personality and what their needs are in life. And so that child may well not develop certain characteristics of their artistic temperament, and it remains in shadow undeveloped because there's not really a meeting for that or, re or a receptivity for those qualities in their parental uh, family. And then finally, the animus, anima, mediates between the self-structure and primarily the ego. A slightly different way to break up these functional complexes was offered by James Hall in Jungian Dream Interpretation. And he says it's useful to think of these as identity structures, which are ego and shadow, and relational structures, anima, animus, and persona. And what he means by relational structures 
the persona mediates our relationship with outside relationships. And the anima animus mediates our relationship with our inner world. But we often speak about complexes rather monolithically. The negative mother, for example, as I just gave in my case example. But really, in actuality, the complexes operate in interactive networks, mutually e influencing each other in the ego complex, such as in the diagram in which the network of interaction between mother, father, child, and ego complexes is governed to a greater or lesser degree by the self. So even when the, for example, when the father is absent, there's still a father present, but it's the absent father that's present in the psyche and that there is no child without parental imagos, parental complexes. So, and there is no, no complex that gets activated that's not in relationship to the ego complex. So all of these things really function together. And while we may speak of them as individual complexes, it's really kind of a, a misperception to speak of them in that way. In reflecting upon each network of interacting complexes, we can use the metaphor of a play taking place on the stage of a theater with an ever evolving cast of actors, sets and scenes playing out on the stage. Often we're not aware of what's happening on the stage though, because it's really going on behind the curtain that separates consciousness and unconsciousness. With dreams, we get to peek under the curtain a little bit with slips of the tongue, with things we become, we fantasize about, with things that we become a little obsessed with. That's like the, conscious, the unconscious contents peeking out from behind the curtain. But we never really see the unconscious depicted in full form without some degree of barrier. The closest we get is in dreams. As long as we're learning to listen in the language of dreams. So in this next vignette, I'm going to uh, show, oh, I'm gonna stop share for just a second and restart because I need to share the sound on this. Okay, what, okay. Okay, so as you're watching, think of this um, as the interaction between an adult male ego complex and his boy-child complex. Oops. Quite a moving work, isn't it? 
The circumambulation of the complex. This is a term Jung coined to describe the process of moving around and around one's complexes in the course of analysis and in life. Over time, so imagine this yellow, this red dot at the bottom as the core of the complex. Over time, one's perspective on the complex changes, depicted here by the upward spiral, representing the gradual increase in one's capacity to reflect upon and gain perspective on one's complexes in the network they exist in. Now, what do we hope to achieve through this circumambulation? The ability to recognize cues which signal the activation of the complex the recognition of how the complex relates to interpersonal problems. This allows the patient to distinguish between what he or she brings via the complex to the relationship problems versus what other people and events bring to these experiences. The recognition and acknowledgement of the power of the complex, insight into the origins of the complex, understanding of secondary gain aspects of symptoms as well as the symptom as effort of self-cure and diminishment of the power of the complex and an acquisition of a greater range of emotional and behavioral patterns. So the life of a complex. Every complex has a narrative to be understood in terms of the past, how the complex developed, the present, how the complex impacts the patient or ourselves current experiences and the future where the complex is taking us or where the complex is trying to restore balance. So just a couple of suggested readings. I strongly recommend Heinz Diekmann's book, Complexes, Diagnosis and Therapy in Analytical Psychology and Earl Shalit's book, The Complex, The Path of Transformation from Archetype to Ego. So again, we'll hold questions for right now because I think uh, Kathleen's presentation will also elaborate on some of these elements. And so we'll turn to Kathleen now. I'm gonna stop screen sharing.